Hello, here we are for the second lecture, which will build on what we said about uh, network, in particular, networks in the brain, in particular, again, networks describing the structural, anatomical, and functional architecture of the brain. And we will see how uh, dynamical models uh, inspired by physics have proven useful in uh, describing the relationship between structure and function in the human brain. So, these are the main uh, problems that we will tackle. We know that in the brain, uh, structure shapes function, oppositely to uh, what happened in uh, architecture, the, in the functionalistic architecture, we were saying that the structure follow function. In this case, in the human brain, function follows structure. What is the extent of this relationship? Is this a one-to-one -one relationship or not? Uh, we have seen before that the graph theory provides a convenient picture of uh, many complex systems, and the brain is no exception. Uh, we also saw last time, and we will maybe uh, go through it together again, how we define nodes and links in the brain. And then uh, we know that brains uh, store, process, and distribute information. And so we could ask ourselves, how is information flow influenced by network architecture? So, uh, concerning the first topic, um, we can observe that uh, at the whole brain scale, there is strong similarity between anatomical connectivity and correlations uh, obtained in the easiest, if you want, um, acquisition of brain activity. So when uh, subjects uh, lay in the scanner uh, with the sole instruction uh, not to fall asleep. And so, um, it has been shown, uh, we have seen also in the last uh, lecture, that uh, brain activity is organized according to long-range uh, correlations and um, large-scale connectivity patterns, which are, have been called resting state or intrinsic connectivity networks. So, uh, one evidence is that time series recorded in different brain areas can show statistical dependencies even without a direct anatomical link. Uh, in order to fill this, uh, this gap, uh, so this uh, non-perfect correspondence between uh, structure and function, so the missing link for understanding the formation and dissolution of patterns of correlated brain areas is the dynamics. Uh, in order to better understand this, we can use models, uh, especially in the last years, uh, it has been uh, increasingly easy to measure non-invasively uh, the structure architecture at large scale of the human brain. And in, in the same way, it's also relatively easy to uh, measure the activity uh, of different brain areas. So the idea is that if we know the structural architecture and we simulate dynamical models living in each brain area, we can uh, then build a model of uh, large-scale multivariate activity and compare this with the empirical um, dynamics that we observe. In this case, we can possibly learn something more about the relationship between structure and function in the brain. Uh, the interesting thing is that several models can be used to uh, address this uh, structure-function relationship, from the most abstract ones to uh, the most biologically detailed ones. A common characteristic of all models is that the optimal working point or explaining the emergency 
uh, of large scale correlated patterns is at the edge of instability. So what is called uh, um, in physics, uh, we are familiar with the concept of uh, criticality. Uh, we can call it bifurcation. We can call it the balance state. Uh, what happens in this balance state? The idea is that there are several attractors which coexist close to this bifurcation point. And so one uh, often used uh, metaphor is the one of a tennis player which uh, waits for the opponent to serve and uh, they're not completely still, but they um, oscillate left, right, left, right uh, on their knees in order to uh, be prepared to the largest possible number of outcomes depending on the serving of the opponent. Analogly, those, the metaphor would be that the brain uh, quickly jumps between uh, several self-organized states, each of these describing a possible uh, a cognitive or uh, pathophysiological state. Indeed, um, in this uh, paper by uh, Gustavo Deco and colleagues in 2012, it has been shown that uh, both the entropy and the number of attractors uh, are maximized in a certain uh, regime of the um, uh, of a specific uh, dynamic model uh, implemented on the human connector. The one explanation of how the switch, the jump between one attractor and another is made um, is noise on one hand and conduction delays on the other. Uh, when it comes to, to physics, so uh, for the rest of this uh, lecture, since this uh, school is mostly uh, aimed to uh, um, to physics as a general uh, principle of uh, organization of the world, I will limit myself to uh, the Ising model, which is possibly the, the simplest uh, model uh, rooted in physics, which have been used to explore the relationship between structure and function in the brain. Another model uh, which has been used uh, is the, the Kuramoto one, describing uh, a couple of oscillators. So, uh, we have seen in the last uh, lecture that there are different ways to quantify statistical dependencies. Here in black, we have the undirectional statistical dependencies and in, uh, in red, the directed ones. Uh, let's briefly recap the definition of Granger causality, uh, which is based on uh, on prediction. So if we have two time series which can be approximated by Markov process and a certain length of a window in the past, we want to uh, treat these quantities as um, realization of stochastic variables X and Y uh, whose measurements we know and so we can have a, pre uh, a prediction of X on the basis of uh, its past only, or a prediction of X based on the past of X and Y. So we can say that uh, the second time series, eta, is caused uh, of uh, Xi if the error, uh, considering the, both the past of X and Y, is smaller than the error considering only the past of x. And then this is the main definition which was true for uh, pairwise uh, bivariate uh, linear autoregressive model and it has been extended to multivariate and nonlinear cases. Then we um, briefly recap the concept of a transfer entropy and we make a link with, uh, with Granger causality because in what follows uh, we will treat them as almost equivalent quantities. So, uh, 
when we perform Granger causality, basically we minimize uh, a functional, and so the error function is minimized uh, in a certain reduced space uh, called hypothesis space. For example, uh, choosing the space of all the linear function corresponds to linear regression and leads to the original implementation of Granger causality. Uh, so, in this case, uh, our risk uh, uh, functional contains uh, to, to be minimized is uh, the, the following. And then we have a functional contain only x and a functional containing x and y. Transfer entropy is a measure of the violation of the property, saying that uh, the regressor function depending only on x and the regression function depending on x and y are the same if uh, y doesn't add any information on the future of x. So uh, the presence of Granger causality implies non-zero transfer entropy. So, the absence of influence is characterized by this generalized Markov property. So, the probability of finding x in a future state depending on the past state of x and y is equal to a probability of finding x in a given state given the past of x alone. On the other hand, transfer entropy quantifies the violation of the above property and measures uh, according to a uh, uh, wide definition, the information flowing from one series to another. Uh, coming back to regression, we can see that the, the minimizer of, the, of this risk function represents the best estimate of x given its past and corresponds to a regression function. If now we explore the Markov properties for uncorrelated variables, so the best estimate of x given x and y when x and y are completely uncorrelated um, is given by the function g and uh, if the Markov property holds it means that uh, the minimizing function f of x is equal to uh, the minimizing function containing x and y so the knowledge of y does not improve the prediction of x so if we look now uh, at the quantities defining transfer entropy and the regression, we can see that there is already a symbolic um, similarity between the two. And uh, the equivalence between the transfer entropy and Granger causality has been demonstrated for Gaussian variables and other quasi Gaussian distribution. In this case, Granger causality is equal to two times the transfer entropy. Uh, in this case, we can estimate transfer entropy from the covariance matrix, or equivalently, uh, we are uh, we can define Granger causality in terms of information flow instead of simply uh, the improvement of a model. Uh, this is uh, a convenient uh, unified approach and is also mathematically more readable. Importantly, for this application, Granger causality and transfer entropy are equivalent for Ising spins uh, when the coupling is low. So you can see here that there is basically an equivalence between uh, Granger causality and transfer entropy for uh, low coupling. Now we will recap um, how we can define the structural connection, so basically the skeleton on which we will implement our dynamical models for the human brain. So uh, we have water molecules which diffuse isotropically in the brain and on the other hand anisotropically when they encounter uh, a white matter fiber. So we can build a probabilistic model of the motion of water molecules in the brain and obtain uh, this uh, uh, reconstruction of streamlines of white matters across the brain in which the color codes the, the direction. So red is horizontal, uh, green is from uh, 
uh, front to back or vice versa, and the blue is from uh, the, the brainstem, from the neck, if you want, to uh, the top of the head. So if we use um, an Ising model in which uh, beta is the uh, inverse temperature and uh, A is the addition symmetrix defined by the structural connectivity, uh, we can uh, consider the, the different configuration of an easing system of n spins living on our network. And in this case, we can find an exact formulation for the transfer entropy. So the transfer entropy between spin i and spin j can be analytically uh, calculated. So now you can ask, okay, but what the heck? We are using binary time series to simulate the brain activity. Uh, but what we saw uh, before, it's really uh, true also for a general class of models. So uh, many models tuned around the criticality uh, reproduce the large uh, scale connectivity patterns observed empirically. And if you look in particular to uh, fMRI activity, so uh, Activity, brain activity recorded in a scanner which records the amount of oxygenated blood present in the brain. Uh, it's worth to recall that um, this signal is the neural signal, whatever it is, involved with the hemodynamic response function, which basically is a transfer function describing uh, the time. Uh, that takes to the blood to be recruited in a certain brain region. So there is an initial dip, there is a peak, and then there is an uh, overshoot, and then return to baseline. All of this in a matter of uh, several seconds. So in this figure, we have in blue real bolt signal filtered in the uh, typical range at which we observe correlation in uh, brain activity, so uh, below uh, 1 hertz. And the bolt system, uh, the bolt signal, sorry, obtained by um, easing spins convolved with the homodynamic response function. And indeed, the, the difference is uh, uh, basically impossible to tell in this case. So, uh, an important characteristic uh, is that the correlation between spins, the transfer entropy between spins, but also this R quantity, which uh, corresponds to the ratio between uh, incoming and outgoing information flow, they all peak uh, in the same range in which uh, our system is tuned around uh, criticality, so around the critical temperature. Uh, if we plot different uh, topological parameters in a fine uh, grained, so uh, thousand nodes of human connect, then we have the efficiency, the strength. So we are we have ordering here the nodes in terms of their connectivity strength. The between the centrality, and then we have this uh, R parameter which corresponds to the uh, unbalance between incoming and outgoing activity. So the closest to uh, uh, to one, the more uh, a node is balanced in what received and in what sends out. So we can see that the nodes which become bottleneck of information uh, are not necessarily the node with the higher strength, not necessarily the nodes with low efficiency, and not necessarily the nodes with high uh, between the centrality. So uh, let's say that uh, information is routed in the brain in a, in a complex way. In particular, it, it appears to, uh, to be a nonlinear relationship between the node strength and the 
relation between uh, incoming and outgoing information. This is the spatial uh, distribution of information bottlenecks across the brain at core scale and at fine scale. And uh, this is the spatial distribution of time between spin flips. So these regions, and in particular, in general, the, the posterior regions are the regions uh, for which the time series more often stay uh, in the same magnetization state. So now, what happens if we preserve total magnetization? Uh, let's say, if we want to find an equivalent of a metabolic conserved quantities in the brain, we should conserve magnetization in our trivial uh, model of brain activity. And so this is given by the Kawasaki update rule, meaning that every time that the spin flips uh, from zero to one, another spin must flip from one to zero. So at the critical point, the spin correlation for the Kawasaki dynamics can be both positive and negative due to the conservation constraint. So this uh, graph plots on one axis the correlation with the a Glauber icing model, so from zero to one, and uh, on the other axis, the correlation with the Kawasaki model, which can be both negative and positive. So, the question is, to which extent are the functional pattern of the easing model shaped by the underlying topology at the level of individual links? So here, if we simulate uh, easing dynamics on the large-scale human connectome, we can see that at the critical temperature, the average correlation between spins is maximized in an absolute value, and also the transfer entropy. On the other hand, the correlation between transfer entropy and real connectivity, anatomical connectivity, and the correlation between uh, empirical um, structural correlation, uh, so, sorry, structural connectivity, and uh, correlation between spins is also minimized. So we have, uh, let's say, a contrasting view of uh, things happening around the critical point. So to better uh, show this on a real uh, case study with a specific hypothesis, we used uh, a data set in which uh, loss of consciousness was induced with the propofol anesthesia. So we ask ourselves, how is the relationship between structure and function modified by anesthesia? And in particular, we uh, ask ourselves whether the magnetization conserved model would add some insight in this relationship. So here we have the correlation between the model spin correlation and the empirical functional connectivity uh, in the Glauber model in dashed lines and in the Kawasaki model in full line, in blue for the anesthesia and in red for the wakefulness state. So we can see that the maximum is of course a different temperature because the Kawasaki and the Glauber model have a different critical temperature. And uh, we can see that in general, the Kawasaki model better uh, arrives to mimic the real um, correlation that you observe. Uh, so we have a correlation of around uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, which is uh, uh, very good also for a, a biologically detailed model. And uh, we can see that the connectivity matches from a parcellation in 116 regions look like that. So we have the structural connectivity here. Here we have the empirical uh, correlation between the 116 brain region in wakefulness, the same during anesthesia. And this is with what we observe in our model with Kawasaki dynamics. So we see the emergence of the same modules here and also uh, more or less the same distribution of positive versus negative correlations.
to better look at this similarity between structure and function, we used um, something which is called cross-modularity. We saw the modularity um, in the past uh, um, lecture, and uh, the modularity basically is a maximum when the probability of having links within subnetworks is higher than the probability of having links across subnetworks. And we can have a modularity in the functional connectivity, so in the networks of statistical dependencies between time series. We can have a modularity on the anatomical connection. And then we can have a hybrid modularity. Basically, we should maximize the modularity in the functional connectivity, the modularity in the structural connectivity, and the overlap between the two. So this um, algorithm is called uh, cross-modularity and looks for a common skeleton of structure and function. So in our case, we can see that the conserved dynamic maximizes the cross-modularity between simulated and empirical dynamics, in particularly in anesthesia. On the other hand, in wakefulness state, this uh, phenomenon is much, much lower. So uh, we can see that anesthesia shapes the cross-modularity between structure and function, also in uh, real data, and also the cross-modularity between structure and simulated data. So here we can see that at the critical temperature, so around the uh, inverse temperature of uh, 2, we have the, the, the cross-modularity between uh, Structure and simulated data is uh, maximized, in particular for uh, a, a few number of, no, uh, of modules, uh, in particular less than uh, 10 modules. And here is the cross-modularity between uh, structure and function in real data in anesthesia and wakefulness. So we can see that the cross-modularity is indeed maximized in particular in anesthesia. So when, let's say, uh, the function is more constrained to structure. So following again the metaphor of our uh, tennis player, in this case, the tennis player would be a bit frozen in one single state, which is the one determined by the structural connection. On the other hand, we observe that the criticality, the distance, between model and empirical data is maximized. So if we look not at the similarity of the patterns, but at the mean square error between the individual, the value of the individual links and the empirical ones, so the empirical and the model ones, we see that this is maximized at the critical temperature, both for Glauber and for Kawasaki, and both for anesthesia and wakefulness. What does it mean? It means that when the dynamical repertoire is maximized, so when we are cl close to the bifurcation, when our system is exploring um, the maximum number of dynamical states that uh, can live of the, on that system, the underlying structure is forgotten somehow. So in particular, at criticality, the most evident properties so the most, the biggest networks, subnetworks are preserved. But if we set uh, to looking for a link-to-link -link correspondence between structure and function, uh, this makes little sense because necessarily, when we explore a large number of, of repertoire uh, of dynamical states, we have to forget, to some extent, the underlying structure. So I hope that. Uh, I gave you a general overview of how um, models rooted in uh, statistical physics can help to uh, address the important problem of the relationship between structure and function in the brain and how this relationship is modulated uh, with the consciousness, which, if you want, is the main uh, characteristic uh, which makes our brains uh, special, or we like to believe so. And uh, yeah, I hope that uh, you will find you find this interesting, and you will be uh, motivated to further look into this issue and to work with us because there's so much to do. Thanks, and bye bye.